to openly um, be talked about is the cost of living. And um, wherever I go, I know you've talked about that this morning, um, the cost of living is just uh, the number one issue uh, facing our country. I've talked about it all the time. Um, I campaigned way back in January this year, uh, before it was adopted by the government, for a windfall tax, um, so that um, we could use that money to fund uh, energy rebates. Um, it, it, it's good news that 8 million families, uh, 8 million of the most vulnerable families in the country, will get up to £1,200 in uh, rebates um, on energy bills and other uh, benefits, which hopefully will help. Every household in the country will get £400 off their uh, energy bills. There's been a fuel duty cut, but in my view, um, petrol and diesel are driving costs. It's what's causing inflation, because it isn't just about motorists. It's the cost of transportation. It affects hauliers. It affects people who drive buses. It affects the NHS who need to use uh, uh, ambulances to affect the police service. Uh, instead of spending money on the front line, they're spending money filling up the uh, police cars with petrol with the police cars. So we do need to go much further on that. On the river. I mean, it's just unsustainable, two pounds plus a litre of petrol and diesel. Um, taxes for the lower paid, I've always campaigned for lower taxes. And um, the government raised the threshold in which people pay tax. Uh, to 12,500. They've also recently cut national insurance tax so that 70% of Harlow households, i.e. everyone except the very rich, 70% of Harlow households will have a national insurance uh, cut. The living wage has been raised as well. Um, so there are lots more measures I could go into. Um, the taper rate um, being helped with the universal credit. Lots more measures I could go to, but I recognise that it's not enough. I recognise that uh, people are, are still struggling, um, but there is an enormous tightrope to walk um, by the government because the tightrope is, on one side you have to help people with the cost, cost of cost of living, on the other side you spend £400 billion pounds dealing with Covid, uh, with £2 trillion pounds in debt. This year the debt interest is around £81 billion. Pounds. And we have to deal with some of that because that interest just grows. I mean, just imagine if we had 80 billion to spend on public services and cutting uh, poverty. So we can't just ignore the debt. You can't just grow the debt because it will be our children, our grandchildren who have to pay that off. And God forbid there's another shock, whether it is an, uh, another COVID three or four, um, or um, a the war gets worse between Russia and Ukraine. We will need to spend a lot of money, and so. We have to recognise two trillion in debt and uh, eighty billion in debt. It just means the government has very, very difficult decisions to take in terms of balancing the need to cut the cost of living. <coughs> okay, questions. <coughs> 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 When you were speaking about the cost of living crisis, I realise that, that, that that's massive now, but I just wanted to make the point that poverty has pre-existed that, and food banks have risen, and the uses of all the services have been on the rise prior to that cost of living crisis. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right, and um, I've never and otherwise. Uh, clearly, of course, there have been problems before all the recent things that have gone on. Um, it's not just in Britain, there were more food banks ahead in Germany and France, um, for example. Um, but there are a lot of good things that have happened. The best way to get people, um, many people have a is to get help get them into work. We've got high employment at the moment. We've got, as I mentioned, more people doing apprenticeships. Um, many young people doing apprenticeships as well, and that will help them. Um, and um, of course, COVID has made things worse. I, I, I'm, and I, I'm trying to work in Parliament to get all the time to get the government to continue to help and deal with some of the, some of the existing, both the short term and the long term problems. Thank you. I think really want to turn this into a question time just for Robert because we've got two other important people here on, on the panel as well, so we must be fair to them uh, as well. But I know that you had your hand up. Would you like the microphone? No, no, that's fine. 
Do you want to introduce yourself and say who you are, where you're from? Yes, sir. Nobody objected to it. They could have objected and called a vote. Nobody objected to it. 
Some of this development rights have actually been very nice. If you look at Pearson House and Edinburgh Way, those are, in essence, permissive development. Right? Some are, are, are less so. And I have uh, constantly campaigned, and the government have changed the rules now in terms of planning, in terms of lighting, in terms of space, and giving councils more, more say. And we need to learn the lessons from it, absolutely. Um, but the principle um, behind making it easier to convert office accommodation to homes for people to live in um, was right. Uh, and I think we should keep that principle, but make sure that they are quality homes. Sorry, and what about transport links for them? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Don't, don't. <laughs> Put your hand up. <laughs> I sort of did, but at the same time, my mouth opened. Sorry. Okay. All right. So just, just hold fire. I promise I will come back to that one. Okay. <laughs> but let's just get back to the themes of today. It's really important about the cost of living. It's really important about the themes that we discussed in all of our workshops. They're all connected. I know you've got lots of questions, so I will come back to you if I may. Uh, this this lady at the back here. My name is Becky, I work for the Trussell Trust, supporting the network of food banks like Carlos. Um, my question is actually for you, Sophie. Thank you for sharing your story. I know the is um, uh, As Trussell, one of the things we're, we advocate for is the kind of a cash first approach, the idea that obviously having money in your pocket stops you having to do things like going to the food bank. I just wondered how much you agree with that. Do you think cash is, that the need for more cash, is it, is it as simple as that, or do you think that there is a need for or other, other services as well, where, where do you rank it? I feel that um, I'm socially involved. Um, I think food banks in some other areas anyway. Um, I do personally want to use food bank like myself as a person maybe. I don't, I think it doesn't matter what age, sex, ethnic, you know, your race or background. A lots of people when I went there, I've been there a couple of times to Harlow Food Bank, there's a lot of people walking into the door. Um, maybe people who work there, maybe people they recognise what's through that door. And it's heartbreaking that you have some access. And I think by throwing more cash at it, it's clearly it's an idea. But accessing other, other services is good. Um, and then the food bank is a good idea. Maybe one day we'll be so the food bank will disappear right at the moment. I think it's just for me a growing concern. Right, so. Um, so I'm Lindsay from the Rebel Link Foundation, and we work with families in um, all different localities as well as Harlow. Um, and one of the kind of questions I had for all three of you really was there's a lot of talk about um, helping really vulnerable families, those on low income, things like that. Um, but we're finding more and more families who have high paying jobs, who are above that threshold, but because their housing cost is so high and everything else is so high, actually the money left in their pocket uh, sometimes doesn't be added. And so, yeah, the question to all of you really, how does that... Um, that level, do we, do we need to get rid of that, really, and look more at what you're, actually, what you're left with rather than what you earn in the first place? Because, um, yeah, say, that would, yeah, whether that's government policy, access and services, or through personal experience, actually, that, that, there's probably ev almost everyone in this room, you know, we're probably not far off needing the services we provide. Yeah, um, great question. Yeah. Great question, and, and certainly in citizens' advice service, we're seeing more and more of the clients that have never used our services before, high income owners uh, coming to see us. So I'm going to go to Robert first of all on this one. Again, I think you make a, a very important point. And just, just to give a recent example, when the government said that every family in the country could get £400 rebate on their energy bills on every household, there was a lot of criticism saying, why are you giving to everyone, not just the most vulnerable? And the reason why, OK, there will be some mega rich people who get it, but there will be a minority. The reason why is exactly the point that you've been making. And there's this uh, phrase, which is not a great phrase, it's just about managing, but these are people in work, um, as you know, who may even own a house first, uh, absolutely. Um, and um, I, I've always talked about those people, who many of them in Harlow. Um, and I think that there needs to be a focus on just about managing as much as the vulnerable. But of course, at the end of the day, with limited resources, you have to focus those on at the very, at the very bottom, out very, very even, for very little. Uh, but the point you make is a powerful one. Sorry. Um, I guess I've gone from a thirty-hour job to a forty-hour job, so I've lost lots of things. I'm in a situation I own my own house, but still I have to. The cost of living is so high, like petrol costs and going to work. And my son only needs out of childcare, but I still have day-to-day -day running to bills. But I still have to access these services, and I don't want to, but I have to. And I think it's great that these services are out, but maybe more should be. I think 
people should be more empathetic and they should be more sympathetic and they should understand um, what people like me are going through because it can affect anybody in this room. Anybody could access these services one day if they need to. You just don't know who's suffering in silence, really. And uh, it does affect your mental health and it makes you go downhill and you think, what the hell are you doing? But you just have to plod in and knowing about these uh, services here, which I never knew about, I knew about the food bank and things, but it's knowing how to access those resources through the internet. That, I think that's quite revealing for me, but I never knew about this. And it's just nice to be part of this situation and understand about what's happening in the it's fabulous. Sharon. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was a brilliant point. Um, very well made, actually. And, uh, and the same as uh, System Advice Bureau, we're finding, so some of you will have heard me talking today about the community hub, the other community hub. Um, and it's a trend we're very much seeing there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I know we're talking about poverty today, but when when we talk about helping people in crisis on the community hub, we don't define what that crisis might be. So, you know, so for some people that's very different for others. And, and sometimes that's not even about money. You know, it could just be about loneliness, um, isolation, it needs to be the area that might be. So, um, you know, not to, not to give the hub another plug, but that is what we try to do. That's the ethos of it, is that we're there as a support service for people in crisis. That's what it is a question, but just to be um, give an example. So with, with the increase in, in wage, I was actually uh, up to £12.63 a month in comparison uh, to the month prior and my increases and my outgoings so far and that will be up again in August um, is £350 extra a month. Um, so I'm not entitled to any additional support um, but yet yeah, obviously the crisis is still hitting home and I'm very much on that order where I'm not sure if come the end, towards the end of the month if I can put petrol in my car to get to work to help them so that's just something I was throwing out there really quick before. But the question that I have is around mental health support and what is being done to tackle that because I think some of the things I hear on the ground is very much around families that say they're in mental health crisis and they're in this really difficult state so they may be told to go to A&E but if they're not suicidal you're not necessarily going to get the, the level of response that you would. And I think it's really difficult for the families to feel like they have a way out and that they have that level of mental health support. And I think services really are overwhelmed in trying to support families with managing their mental health. And I'm wondering what is or is coming to Harlow to help try and tackle that. Okay, so I know Lois is desperately getting my attention to say that she wants to intervene on that one. So, Lois, would you like to say? So, firstly, if you're a mental if you're in a mental health crisis, please don't just go to A&E. No, Phone 111, option two, and very rarely will you be told to go and eat, go to A&E because you will get straight through to Crisis 24, 24 hour service, they don't <coughs> stop at two in the morning like they used to, and they will triage you and get you to the right bit of all the crisis services. This is for adults. Okay. There's another number for children which doesn't it in the top of my head, but don't just go to A and E because you'll wait for a very long time to see the right person. Whereas you will get to see the right person a lot sooner if you use one more one option two. And, and I think that's what some of the families have said that they've done. Not just the option two, but they've said I've got one more one. I've said this is what my child's presenting as yeah. my young person. There's another number me. for the young people, okay. which I will find for you in a minute and give Great. to you. Thank you very much. But in Harlow, you're really lucky. You've got mental health support teams in a lot of Harlow schools who will support the children, the parents, and the school staff. There's also opportunities for way more mental health learning for schools and all the support staff who work around schools, which is being delivered by the Department for Education. So you're really lucky because you've had the mental health support team in schools who work through Minding West Essex. And there are local people working in your local schools and colleges. It's all the way through. So <coughs> please don't think that the mental health support isn't there. Unfortunately, we haven't got enough staff. You know, so recruitment into health and social care, we are struggling. 
we can't keep good staff in schools in our in our mental health services. So if anybody wants a job, they can talk to us. Can I can I add something really briefly? So, I super super Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, yeah, yeah. we get through this in time. So, keep that passion, keep that question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got five minutes then. Okay, so did you want to ask a question? I just want Would you like the microphone? No, oh, I'm okay. not leaving. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to say when you're speaking about um, apprenticeships, my daughter was lucky enough to become. Working in a school, things like teachers and nurses should not have to pay for their degrees, and I think that would be <laughs> Graduate teaching degree apprenticeships. I campaign all the time for teacher degree apprenticeships. Some people in the government are against this because they say that every um, teacher needs to go to university. I don't happen to agree with that. Um, and I would like, I, I think the way to solve this issue that you raised is through the higher, through the higher apprenticeship. I think they're, they're listening on the teacher side, but at least they've done it for, for the nurses. Yeah. And congratulations to your daughter as well. <laughs> I was saying earlier, sorry if I repeat myself, um, we are all here to support causes and poverty here today, but how do you feel um, the access to the service, um, is it easy things to do or is it hard? And do you think that the service that you are offering, it's uh, easy to understand? Because I was saying earlier, if you look for a job, you go to job centre, you have the employer, they say what they look for, and then you know what you can have access. If you look for a house, it's the same. If you look for love, it's the same. You go on Tinder, you match. If you look for help, because you're just not, you're not just looking for money. You're not just looking for mental health support. You're looking for everything. You're looking as a family. You're a part of a family, so you impact all your family from the child to the grown-up. So how the um, the access to the, the service is for you, as you you might have. Um, Sophie, is it Sophie? You, you probably uh, have been filling millions of forms to identify who can support you. And so can we all together do that more often first? And, and, and can we have something like we can just tick the box and then we all fusion together? So yeah, describe your services, how is it? How is it? Right, so accessibility of service really and uh, awareness. So sorry to this one for you. How, how do you find that here in Harlem? Um, I think it's, it is accessible. Some of the forms are tedious and they go on forever. Um, I think it could be easily done. Um, is there people you can contact more? Um, it is known how to access them and, and the right people at the right time are not being passed from here as opposed to basically. Um, how you do that, I don't know. Um, but I think one service piece of into another. I've heard a bit about rainbows and I know I've accessed mine before in my own mental states out of the area. Um, but it's really knowing how to do it and how you go about it. You can talk, talk, talk as many times as you want in a room. It's really knowing what to do for the best. This, I, a few people to thank. The Rugby Club has given us this place for free today, which is, which is great. And, um, the Rugby Club has always been very generous. They have a food bank box that you might see on the way in. Every other week, they come and they enter the house, all the way up to the Nelson Hall Farm. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who has been involved from all the different uh, agencies. Thanks to our guests who've come. If I try and tell you their names, I'll forget completely, but I was late like, last night typing it all up. And um, the surprise, I have a, a surprise for you at the end. And it's a surprise for me too because the people providing the lunch have yet to arrive. <laughs> so, we have called them, 
We have fallen several times. And um, so there's an option now. <laughs> option A. What I want to take away from this is a sense that if we may get back to you and say, perhaps there's been a lot of information sharing, and that is always at the cost of conversations between us. Perhaps the next time we meet, we have more conversations between us. Uh, I suspect there's possibly as much, if not more, information carried in the many bodies here than there have been the people presented to us. But our mission was to make sure we're on the same page, <coughs> that we have the right information, we know where the information lies. I'm amazed how much of information we've got through in the morning. So at the very least, we've got the kind of knowledge we need to move forward. I, like you, probably very frustrated because I've probably heard the things I've heard before. But at the same time as that, I've met some people and I think, oh, they're wonderful, they're brilliant, they've got so much more to add. And I think everyone that was here is probably one of them. Rob was right about the social capital we've got in the room. I'd really like to just keep knocking on your door saying, come back, come back, help solve this. You know, we can talk about money as well. We can't do that much about it right now except knocking on his door and or knocking on the doors of the political parties that we may support. That's another thing entirely compared to working together to see what we can do for people in Harlow. So thanks so much for being part of that. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for letting me email you back and just in case you want to stay, stay involved. Uh, we are planning to put a short report out about what we've, uh, the things we found today. I think most people have said that we can send their uh, PowerPoints. I'll double check with them and then I'll send that to you as well. Because the content of those PowerPoints, I mean, if you're a fundraiser like me, <laughs> there's a lot of good content in those PowerPoints uh, for your next funding application. Uh, so there's a lot of good things that, that are coming our way. So uh, thank, thank you. Um, I won't pad any longer. Uh, if, if you want to stay, please stay. If you want to meet each other, please talk. We can see it as a fasting lunch. Uh, uh, but otherwise, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Write to me if anything you want. Please join the Poverty Alliance if you can. Get on those calls and, and put your piece in. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.